Let's just bow our heads. Lord, I want to thank you that we have this opportunity to come together and open your word. I pray to you, Lord, that whatever is said here today, are your words and not mine, and that we can walk away from here knowing that we've been in your presence and that we've got food, not just for ourselves, but for other people as well. For this I pray in your name. Amen. I want to talk to you today about true worship and false worship. It's a bit of a complex thing, and when you look at people, they're very complex people. People are always... You can't work them out, can you? First of all, there are men and women. Men can't work out the women. Women can't work out the men. Isn't that the story? If you can work out a woman... Yeah, all right. No matter what you do with people, if they have a good time in life, if they feel that they're happy and there's nothing going on in their life, they have to have something to go on. They need a trauma. They need something that they can say they're alive. Why? Because we watch TV, and TV tells us that every time there's... Good things happen in your life. Just when you're coming to an impasse, which is nice and easy, what happens? Don't miss it next week, the trauma of, and there's always something, all right? We have to have something in our life. If there's nothing happening, are we alive? Are we alive? And when I speak to people, my friends, wherever I go, the complexity of people is just incredible. If life is easy, what do we have to do? We've got to make it complex. Ponder this. To keep us safe and out of trouble, we demand clear and precise directions and warnings. Isn't that correct? If we go somewhere, we, we want signs that are clear and they're precise to tell us what's going to keep us out of danger and what's going to happen. Even men like to have clear and pr precise directions when we're putting together flat packs. But what's the problem with men? We don't read them until it's... It's not coming together. And then when we read them, we say, well, these directions are no good anyway. <laughs> eh? Who wrote these things? And they do them in cartoon form us, and we still don't like them. But we still like to have clear and decisive directions and warnings. And when we get told something, my friends, we don't like to be told anyway. Yeah? There are signs that tell us we can't do things, and what do we do? We get a huff on because who's telling us we can't do this? When we were in Queensland, in a shopping centre over there, this sign always amused me. In the undercroft, there was this sign that says, do not discard trolleys in this area. Why? Because they've got a room there where they've got inflammable liquids, and they need to get to it. And every day, no matter what time of day it was, people park their trolleys where it says, do not park their trolleys in this area. Why? Because you don't tell me where I'm going to park my trolley. No sir, Jim Bob but they want clear signs that says, where do I park my trolley? Aren't we complex? What about the towing thing? In America, in other places in Europe, they say if you park your car here, what can happen? It can be picked up and be taken away. Over here in Australia, we only get parking fines after parking fines after parking fines. And we say, but why? Why didn't they put up proper signs to say, I can't park here? Eh? Every time there's a sign that says something, we read it and we go, oh yeah, we give it a go. And then when we get caught out, we say, well, that sign wasn't very clear, was it? Was I supposed to park this way a little bit? Or was I supposed to park this way a little bit? I think there's something wrong with the sign. I like this one here, this guy here. Have a look at the red car. All right? This car, what's he doing? I can see his tail lights when I should be seeing his headlights. He should be on the other side of the road, and I guarantee you when he entered the highway, the freeway there, he probably came across a sign that says, wrong way, go back. And he would have said, this sign says wrong way, go back, and applies to everybody else but who? But me. So he drives down the freeway, coming head on. Yeah, what a complex society we live in. Life is complicated. I love it every time you watch TV when you talk to young people and they've got problems in their life. They say, Pastor, life is complicated. And you go, yeah, and yeah, it's complicated. So what's the issues? <laughs> he couldn't understand, Pastor, it's too complicated. And complicated seems to cover everything in this world at the moment. Whatever it is, it's complicated. More signs, more signs. We say we need to know what we can't do. And there's a sign and there's advertising that goes in over and over again that says, do not text while you're driving. Yeah, you've seen those advertising? Who hasn't seen that on TV, on the radio? Who hasn't seen 
Oh, don't we get told we're not allowed to text here? Are we allowed to text while we drive in, in South Australia? No. Come on, people, you can put your hand up if you saw. There, there is. Come on, we've seen them, haven't we? It says, do not text while you drive. Why? Because it's dangerous. It also says, do not what? Use your mobile phone while you're driving. We need to be told precisely what we can do with our mobile phone when we're in the car. Don't text, don't drive, and when we get caught out, we get upset. Yeah? We get upset with the coppers. Copper, what do you think you're doing? I, I wasn't using the phone, I wasn't texting. And then I love what they always say. Why don't you go out and get some real criminals? <laughs> you know, when I was a copper, when I was a copper, and I pulled people over, and I was just going to caution them, when they said to me, why don't you go get some real criminals, out came the book, and they got fined, all right? So do not, do not tempt the police by saying, go get some real criminals. I love where they have speed camera signs all over the shop, big signs, don't speed, don't speed, don't speed. And then we get caught and we say, oh, it's only for revenue, isn't it? Yeah. We need to know where we can't speed because for the safety of ourselves and others. And then we get caught out, we say, oh, it's for revenue. And then we also say, but where are the signs? I didn't see them. You know why you didn't see the signs when you're caught for speeding? Because you're going too fast. You can't see the signs. When we get caught out again, we get upset with the bobbies. Those damn bobbies, I tell you. Look, when I was in Queensland, I loved this sign. There was this little ute. There's a power company over there called Ergon. And I was at the service station, and this guy pulls up in the ute. He's got all the work trays on the back. You've seen those where they've got the fold-out um, doors, and they've got all the equipment in the back of the trays. And he has written there on this little sticker, and I was interested to see what's on the sticker. And the little sticker there says, oh, come back. The little sticker says, Check all cupboards are closed and secure. Do a 360 check of the vehicle, use a spotter. So if you're going to reverse your vehicle, you've got to make sure that all your cupboards are closed. You go around the car, make sure there's nobody around there, there's no hazards. All right? And if there's a hazard, you use someone to help you come back. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that sign a little bit insulting if that was on my car, because God gave me a brain and if I have a work vehicle that has the flaps open and I'm going to reverse, I close them down. I don't know about you, but that just seems logical to me. And if I'm in a hazard area, I tend to walk around and make sure it's all clear. But you see, we love to have signs to tell us what to do. But then we hate the signs when they tell us what we need to do. This is the classic one, of course, eh? Wet paint. I love people who come along and the sign says wet paint. They might not sit on it, but when you see a sign that says wet paint, you are always tempted to do what? You have to touch it, all right? And you go, oh, yeah, it is wet. <laughs> oh, duh. Now, come on, people. This one here where it says do not touch, and what's she doing? Of course, she's got to touch. If you want people to touch something, my friends, right on there, do not touch, and I'll guarantee you, people will come along and they will touch it. The old button that says do not press. And what do people do? Really? Or just, oh yeah, oh yeah. We need signs. I love this sign. This one just cuts me up. What's it say? It says caution. This sign has sharp edges. Do not touch the edges of this sign. What sort of society are we getting into where the sign has to be notified so you don't touch the sign because it's sharp? Unbelievable. We're complicated type of people. We need to have instructions. And I can almost guarantee you for that one as well, somebody would have come along and touched the edge to see whether it was sharp. Oh, yeah, I'm bleeding. That's, uh, it's sharp. You know, secular people are not the only people who need to have, more, have, to have warnings about things who need to be told what to do and then re regret it when they get told what to do. In the Bible, in the Scripture, in their spiritual life, we also have warnings, clear warnings about false worship and true worship. And that goes right throughout the Scriptures, my friends. Right throughout the Bible, you will find warnings. The Bible opens with a great warning against false worship. Yeah, We were talking about that this morning. 
right in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, it warns about false worship. And what is that without looking it up? Oh, we're Adventists, so we don't talk to the pastor. We just sit there and let the sun come in and relax. Eh? <laughs> Basically, isn't that when Jesus or God says to, the, to Adam and Eve, do not go and eat from what? The tree. The tree. Oh. You can eat from all the others, but you can't eat from that one. And then, of course, we know that the devil comes along and he says, what? Ah, she's right, mate, you can eat from it. And they make the choice between false worship and true worship. If you listen to God, true worship. If you listen to the devil, that's false worship. And what about closing in Revelation, the very last thing in Revelation? We find there that John the Revelator has been talking to us and writing down all about false worship and true worship. And then right at the end of the book, we find that John the Revelator, who should know what is true worship and false worship, falls down to the, and bows to the angel that has been talking to him. And the angel says to him, do not bow down to me, because I am only what? Messenger like you and me. Worship God. So from the beginning of the Bible, my friends, to the end of the Bible, there are clear warnings about who we should worship, who we should not worship. And God writes it out to us. He spills it out to us in no uncertain term. In the first and second commandments, he says, you shall have what? No other God before me. He doesn't say, you can have maybe one or two gods before me. He doesn't say, maybe if I'm not responding, you can try another god. He says, how many gods can you have besides him? None. There is one god and one god alone. And which God is that, my friends? God the God of creation. Yeah? The God of heaven, the God of creation, the great I am. There is no other God. Second commandment, he says, You shall not make for yourself any idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. He doesn't say, maybe you can have a little picture of something that you bow down to if things are not going well. He says, what? You shall not bow to anything. You shall not worship anything as a God, but God and God alone. When Jesus was here, he told his disciples to go out amongst the whole world, to spread the message of Christianity, to spread the message of the kingdom of God that has come upon this earth. He told them to go out and tell people everything that he had taught them. And amongst the things he had taught them, my friends, was this. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, in the Clear Word Bible, it says, Man shall acknowledge God as the owner of this planet and worship and serve him only. As God of the owner of this planet. Why is God the owner of this planet? He made it. He's the God of creation. He is the one and only God that we should be worshipping to. He should be the only God that we are bowing our knee to. A clear warning that Jesus told his disciples to go and spread out to all those who follow him. There is no ifs or there are no buts. So where does false worship start from? Well, our friend Lucifer. <laughs> That's a loose term, friend. We can call him Lucifer because that's his name. But let's use an Australian sort of way of talking. Okay, I won't. Let's call him Lucifer. Lucifer was in heaven. He was one of the prettiest angels that you can come across. He was an archangel. He was in charge. He was in charge of thousands and who knows, billions of perhaps angels up there. And then one day he got it into his head that he wanted to be more than just an angel, that he wanted to take over the whole shing and ding. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to be the God. He wanted to take everything over. And we find in Isaiah 14, verses 13 and 14, it says this about him. It says, you, and this is the speaker, said in your heart, I ascend to heaven. I will rise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Who is he? I. It's I. It's I. It's I. He's become involved with himself. He's worshipping himself. 
He's seen himself as a beautiful being. He's seen himself as somebody in charge of everybody. And he says, I, I can worship myself. People can worship me. And the incredible thing is, of course, he took a third of his angels with him, didn't he? A third of his angels in heaven, those who never saw sin in the whole time when there was heaven from eternity, from the start of eternity, whenever that is. They have never seen sin. They've never seen pain and suffering. And all of a sudden, Satan says, Lucifer says, I will give you something that is better than you have here. And a third of the angels bow down to him. Self-worship is false worship, is destructive worship. Yeah. Lucifer was worshipping himself. Lucifer encouraged the angels to worship him. And the result of that was that they were cast out of heaven. And the result of that in the future, my friends, is what? That they will lose their eternity life. Yeah. Lucifer's self-worship led to false worship of him by angels and humans, which resulted in their downfall and ultimately to their eternal destruction. Sin came into this world and we die. That is true because that is part of sin. But ultimately, if we are worshipping the false God, my friends, we lose our eternal life, the life to come, the life that is into heaven. Everyone who follows Lucifer, everyone who does false worship, my friends, those who do not worship God, my friends, will lose their eternal life. It's as simple as that. Let me just ask you this question. When it comes to Adam and Eve eating whatever it was, is it important to know what sort of fruit they actually ate? I hear people arguing it was a pear. It wasn't a pear, it was an apple wasn't an apple, it was a tomato. And they get off on what sort of fruit they were eating. Totally irrelevant. Totally irrelevant. Then I hear people argue the point and say, Oh, women. Oh, you women. If you, hey, if you didn't eat the fruit, us men wouldn't have to suffer these sins as well. Oh, let's blame the woman. Is that really what, was, what the issue was here? Who ate the first fruit? No. The issue was here that God said to both man and woman, he said both to Adam and Eve, you can eat from every tree, but do not eat from that one, because if you do, you will surely die. They should be listening to him because he is God, yeah? And then they went and they listened to the false god who was disguised as a serpent, and we know that to be the devil, and they listened to him. My friends, the issue here is to who they were listening to, the true God or the false God. And they showed exactly who they were going to follow by listening to what the snake was telling them. It's not about apples. It's not about pears, my friends. It's not about the women. It's not about the men. It's about the choice they made. Do we choose to follow the true God or do we choose to follow the false God? So let's not get all hung up about women. Let's not get all hung up about men. Eh? We all made that decision whether we like it or not. And in the end, my friends, if you continue to follow and worship the false God, we will lose our eternal life. People in the people in the gospel, people in the Old Testament, we can look at them and say, man, they're pretty flimsy in their beliefs, aren't they? Think about the children of Israel. They spent 400 years in Egypt. They spent 400 years in captivity. And then God comes along and he performs his plagues. He performs his miracles to get them out of Egypt. And all these plagues that came upon Egypt... Played who? It just played the Egyptians, yeah? What happened to all of God's people? They were walking around in the same streets. They were in the same area, my friends, and yet they were not affected by any of those plagues. God performed miracles. God performed miracles to get them out of Egypt. 
And when they left Egypt, you would think that their, that their strength and their faith in God was so strong, nothing could shake them. And yet we find that when Moses was called up on Mount Sinai to speak to God, and the people started to wonder where Moses was, where did they turn to? What did they do? They turned straight away from the true God to the false God and they built themselves a cow that they would worship. How quick they were to turn from the true God to the false God. And we can look at the Old Testament people and say, man, they were weak in faith. But that, does that also apply to us? Do we swing from the true God to the false God? To true for worship, to false worship? Or can we just contently sit in our pews and say, these people of the Bible, look at them, what faith did they have? My friends, these issues are put in the Bible to remind us that we are just as weak as them. These are put in here warning us how quick it is for God's people to go away from true worship to false worship. These are just some of the times when God's people went away from worshipping him and they went away to worshipping false gods. And the worst of those gods was Moloch. Moloch. A false god where they would bring their children up and they would place their children into the arms of Moloch and roll them into the fire and everybody was happy because now something beautiful was going to transpire in the next week. Well, that's the hope anyway. Moloch is just a statue. Moloch is just something that was built. Who does he really represent? Who were they really worshipping? Satan. No, Satan. <coughs> Satan. It doesn't matter what the image looks like, my friends. It doesn't matter what the image they call it. It is false worship, and false worship is you are worshipping God and not the true God, the God of creation, the God of heaven. God will always come through. There are times when we feel that we are the only ones who are faithful to God. There are times when we feel that we are only ones who are worshipping God correctly. And when we look at the Bible, the Bible gives us illustrations and hopes of times where there are other people who felt just like us. What about this young man, Elijah? Man, he thought that he was the only one worshipping God in the true form, didn't he? And he did wonderful miracles. God said to him, challenge, challenge all these false gods. And the challenge was put forth between the true God and the false God. What was the challenge? The challenge was... Yeah, and remember Elijah said, well, okay, you guys, I'm going to give you a head start. Don't you love it when you see that? I'm going to give you a head start. You guys, kill what you, you, whatever you have to do, burn whatever you have to do, get the whatever. I'll just wait here and see what transpires, and I'll start a little bit later. Pretty cocky, I reckon. But then he goes, yeah, all right, you come. And then when nothing happens and they sort of beat themselves out and they all come to a stage where they're getting frustrated and angry, he says, now, now I'll show you guys how it's done. He says, he builds the altar, he gets his calf and whatever it is, he puts it on top, and then he says these amazing things. What's he say to them? Put water. On what? Everything. On the wood, yeah. And then he says, keep pouring water. And then he says, hang on, keep pouring water. And he says, keep pouring water until when? Until water starts running down. And I can imagine the people going, wow, well, wow, well, what's this guy up to? He's a bit of a wally, isn't he? That's an Australian term for someone who's not, you know, he's a bit of a strange person. They said, well, maybe he's a bit of a wally. And, of course, Elijah's a little bit cocky. He says, okay, now I'll show you how it's done. Kaboof! It comes down and it burns up the sacrifice. And it doesn't burn up the sacrifice. It burns up what? The, yeah, the woods and the stones. It burns up everything. The true God showed that he was there and the true God showed that the false gods were just what they are, absolutely false. Just because everybody else seems to be worshipping something that seems to be great and seems to be the thing of the day, doesn't mean 
that it's correct. Yeah. Sometimes we have to walk against the flow of the traffic. These three people here, they also stood up for God. You know them. Meshach, who? Thank you very much. And you remember the story, of course, when King Nebuchadnezzar builds this big statue about himself, self-worship again, and he says, if you don't bow down to it, what happens? You're going to be put into the fire. And we know the story that they stoke up the fire, and they stoke up the fire so, so hot, it tells us. The fire is so hot that those people stoking the fire and who bring the three men to the fire, they collapse. It's too hot for them. They burn. And yet these three men go into the fire and while they're into the fire, God performs a miracle. What is the miracle? Yeah, there's another one standing there with them, an angel, and we know that not a hair on their body is singed. And when they come out the fire, they smell as sweet as roses. I don't know if they smell as sweet as roses, but they come out not smelling of smoke or of fire. Sometimes it's really, really difficult, isn't it, to say, hey, we're going to worship the true God as opposed to the false God, because everybody else is doing it. And everybody else might say, hey, listen, what's it going to hurt, Nathan, if you just you know, pretend you're bowing your head, pretend you're bowing down, yeah, just do it, man. Get it over done with. There is true worship, there's false worship. And Satan even took his fight up to Christ when Christ was here on this earth. When Lucifer was beat in heaven, he knew he was beat there. But when Christ was here on earth in human form, Lucifer decided that he would give it one more chance to get Christ to worship him. And he says to him, when he took him to a high point, I will give you, he said, if you bow down, sorry, all this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me, Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, first of all, what a lot of bahumbug. What a lot of bahumbug. Satan stands up in front of Jesus and he says, all this, all this, I will give you. Who does all this belong to in the first place? God. Jesus is part of God. It all belongs to Jesus anyway. Jesus was there in the creation of the world. So he's trying to give him something that doesn't belong to him in the first place. That's like me going outside to you and finding a real good car and saying, Janelle, I'm going to give you this car if you just bow down to me. It's not mine, but that doesn't matter. Bow down to me. Hey, bow. What a lot of humbug. And Jesus wasn't tempted, even though he was hungry, even though he was thirsty. My friends, he didn't bow down to Satan. He told him that there is no one else that we should worship except for God and God alone. The devil is a very clever fellow. He attacks false worship and true worship in very cunning ways. And we read there in the Bible that Paul and Barnabas were going out and they were preaching the word of God. See it there in Acts chapter 14, verses 8 to 18. And we find that when they're out preaching to the people about the word of God, the people start running to them and they're saying, hey, these guys are gods. Paul and Barnabas are gods. And they said, Paul, they called him Hermes. You remember the Greek called God Hermes? He got little fluffy wings on his, on his heels. Brrr, flies around. Hermes the messenger. You're into that? You're not into that? Well, now you know it. All right? So they called him Hermes the messenger because he's messaging. All right? And they called Barnabas Zeus. You can't get any better than Zeus. All right? He's a top man. And here we could have self-worship come in really easy. Couldn't. Couldn't Paul and couldn't Barnabas say, well, hey, these guys, these guys are looking up to us. These guys think there was something special. We can have the easy life now. Why go around and, you know, 
go into places we don't even know and talk about God, when we can just stay here and pretend we are gods. They will worship us. They will give us food. They will put us on high pedestals. Aren't we sometimes tempted? Eh? Aren't we sometimes tempted ourselves to say, yeah, these guys are praising me up. I like this. Let's not tell the truth. Let's just stick with the praise up. A bit of self-worship doesn't go astray. And we find, and we find that the priests were bringing out the bulls to sacrifice in honour of Paul and Barnabas. But then luckily, Paul and Barnabas got it together up here and they remembered the warnings that they were given. You shall have no other gods besides who? The God of creation. And my friends, no other gods includes yourself. Yeah? Includes yourself. So we find that Paul and Barnabas run out and they say, hey, we're only men like you. Knock it off. Go back. We're just here to preach the word of God. How tempting it must have been. How tempting it must have been to take on the form of God's. In my ministry, my friends, and I heard it this morning, perfectionism comes up in the Adventist church more times than I like to hear. I don't like to hear it any time. And they tell me there are people, and I've been confronted by people, good Adventist people, whatever a good Adventist person is, good Adventist people who tell me, Pastor, you know, I haven't sinned for the last week. I have overcome this sin and this sin and this sin all by myself. And you, Pastor, you too could do this. You just concentrate on one sin, overcome that. Then you concentrate on the next sin and overcome that. And then you concentrate. And then, Pastor, you will be like us. You'll be perfect. Ah. Oh. You can cry, can't you? Because perfectionism is what is self-worship. Self-worship is what? False worship. False worship is what? Destructive worship. There is no such thing as a perfect person on this earth. No matter how good you think you might be, you're no good at all. And if you think you're pretty good, you need to go back to the Bible and see what the Bible says about perfection. The person who says they have not sinned, or what? Yeah. Somebody who claims to be perfect, my friends, are replacing Jesus with themselves. Someone who claims to have perfectionism over sin has replaced Jesus for themselves. And if you replace Jesus for yourself, you are not a Christian. You cannot in any form and way call yourself a Christian if you believe in perfectionism. Because a Christian is what? Is a person who takes on the teachings of Jesus Christ, who lives the life of Jesus Christ, who goes out and tells other people about Jesus Christ to get them converted to Jesus Christ. Not to themselves. If you are perfect, then where does Jesus fit in that picture? He doesn't. You cannot be and call yourself a Christian if you believe in perfectionism because you have replaced Christ, the most pinnacle thing in all of history, the most pinnacle thing for our eternal life. Those who obey the commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus, they are the people who can call themselves Christians. If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what is accepted, let him be eternally condemned. That's pretty scary. If anybody is preaching to you a gospel that is different to what the gospel is, if anybody is preaching to you perfectionism, is that in here? That's a different gospel, my friends. And if you are preaching something completely different to what is in here, then you need to be very careful where you might end up when Jesus comes back. 
In Galatians 1.10, Paul says, If I were trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Scripture tells us there is a time coming when people will no longer listen to sound doctrine. They will gather them around themselves, people who want to hear, to hear what they want to hear. What they want to hear. There are plenty of people who want to hear what the pastor has to say. There are plenty of people who come into churches to see what the church will say. But they don't want to hear what is in here. They don't want to hear what Christ wants them to do. They don't want to hear what the commandments tells them to do. They want someone to tell them what they can do. Yeah, no worries. You can go out and commit adultery. No worries. And I'll be the most famous preacher in all of Port Augusta, I can tell you. I can fill this church day and night. Go commit adultery. You can go steal. No worries. What did you say? You want to murder? Yeah, go murder. And people will come because they're preaching. I'm preaching to them what they want to hear. But as soon as I say to them, you may not commit adultery. God says you cannot. God says you cannot kill somebody. God says you should not steal. And all of a sudden the churches start to dwindle, hey? Have you noticed that about the churches? Not just the Adventist churches, my friend. You go into any other denomination and they're starting to dwindle with membership, with people in the pews. Why? Why? Because people don't want to hear what's in here. And that is nothing new. Even here in Isaiah, we're told that people said to their prophets, Stop telling us what God wants us to do. Yeah? The children of Israel, those who were supposed to be so faithful with God, they said, stop telling us what God is telling us He wants us to do. Tell us what we want to hear, even though it is false. My friends, it's happened in the past, it's happening in the present, and it'll happen in the future even more. You need to be careful who you worship. You cannot claim that you're worshipping God, the God of creation, worshipping Jesus Christ, if you're telling them something that is different in here. Yeah? Be careful of what you preach and what you teach. Someone else who claimed and continues to claim that he is spiritually perfect is Lucifer. That is Satan, of course replacing God and Jesus with himself. Wasn't that his big problem to start with? I am beautiful. I know everything. I am perfect. Look at me. I am perfect. Everybody worship me. When you're into perfectionism, my friends, have a think as to who your leader is. It's not God. It is Satan himself. You know, there are times in Scripture we are told, and it's to encourage us, that there are times out there where people don't want to hear who the true God is. They know about the true God, but they don't really want to hear about it. Some people are confused as to who they should be worshipping, who they should not be worshipping. You go out and speak to people now in the community, and they'll say, yeah, I know there's something in heaven looking after us. I believe there is some greater being out there that takes care of us, but I don't know who it is or what it is. Should I be worshipping them? What should I be worshipping? And that gives us an opportunity to talk to them about Jesus Christ. Do what Paul did here when he went to Athens. He went around and he looked at all the different altars that were there for all the different gods that people were worshipping. And then he comes to the altar for the unknown God. And he uses that opportunity and he says, you know this altar that you guys are going to? You know this altar of the unknown God that you are bowing down and you're worshipping you know who that God is? It is the God of creation. It is the God of creation. Didn't press the button. Just because people don't want to hear us, my friends, shouldn't give us the excuse to turn around and just walk away and say nothing. Right through scripture, right through history, God has always had his people who stand up for the truth, who speak the truth, no matter how bitter that might be for them to swallow. 
there is a thing, there is a saying here, it takes courage for Christian leaders to stand on the principle of the Word of God. And I say it takes courage for all Christians to stand on the principles of the Word of God. Yeah. And let me ask you this question. What is the most difficult principle that you will ever stand upon or have to stand upon right through life? Sorry? Yeah. <coughs> the most difficult principle that you will ever have to stand upon, my friends, is the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment. You can tell other people, I love Jesus, I love Jesus too. You shouldn't commit adultery, I agree, but we shouldn't commit adultery. You shouldn't murder, I agree with that. You should only have one God, oh yeah, I agree with that too. But when it comes to the fourth commandment, that is the most difficult one for anyone to keep. That is the most difficult commandment for our young people to have to face. As they grow up, when they play sports, when they look for employment, when it comes to keeping the fourth commandment, the one of the seven-day Sabbath, that is the most difficult principle upon which they will have to stand. My friends, there are all sorts of different religions getting on in this world. They might look good, they might do good, they might feel good. But are they worshipping the God of creation? No. So unfortunately they are false worshippers. Islam, my friends. In Islam there are very good and very nice Muslim people. But are they worshipping the God of creation? No. It's a false worship. For there is one God and one media between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all men. That doesn't say Muhammad, it doesn't say Buddha, it doesn't say whoever else. There is only one, and that is Jesus Christ. Therefore, all the others, my friends, are false worship. Let's just talk about our saints. You go into into cathedrals, you go into different churches and into different religions and they have these icons of the saints, they call them Paul, Peter, Mary or whoever the case may be and they bow their knee to them and they worship them and we are told if the saints can intercede or mediate in heaven then the whole question of Jesus as our intercessor or media, mediator is downgraded. Why on earth did Jesus bother coming down to this earth and die on the cross for our sins, if we can get that job done very quickly by worshipping an icon, by worshipping a picture, by worshipping a dead human being. We can't. We can't. For those who bend the knees to these things, to these icons, my friends, that is false worship. I'm not knocking the people, let me tell you this because they're doing what they honestly believe. But what they're doing is false worship. It's false worship. And of course you know the big false worship that's coming upon the earth. I don't have to tell you that. You're all good Seventh-day Adventists. We're all afraid of the big 6-6 six, six coming along. Yeah. We're all afraid of the day that comes along where we won't be able to buy and sell. Yeah. We know it's happening now. What's happening with the, with the money that we used to have? It's disappearing out of our wallets. Where's it going? It's going electrical. Why is it all going electrical? Because it's easier for us to do transactions. Because no one can rob you and take your cash money. Good answers. But why is the government going a cashless society? It's all part and parcel of this. We panic as Adventists say, Oh, when the end comes... Oh, how can we get... It's, we're here. It's happening. It's happening around us. That's why Jesus says, you've got to be awake. Have a look around what's happening to you. Huh? It's happening so quickly and quietly upon us that we can fall into the trap of false worship. Oh, I can't buy or sell anything. I better go see what I can do. The only one who will get us through those last days of when. Christ and Christ alone. No.
Let me just speak about this. While we're waiting for the big 6-6 six, six to come along and we say, we're ready for it. All around us, from when we are born until the day we die, we are tempted to indulge in false worship. There is, of course, the God of money. And I must admit, I've fallen to that God many a good time. I have to make money, have to provide, have to go and do more money, have to do, oh, the great dollar bill. Yeah. You've got to be careful, my friends. Worshipping money is just as bad. That's false worship. There's beauty. Oh, how this world likes to talk about beauty. None of us are good enough. No matter how beautiful you think you are, we are told you're not beautiful enough, are you? The campaigns tell us, man, you need to put this on and you need to have this and you need to have this cosmetic stuff put on. You need to have this surgery and you need to spend this money because you need to look beautiful and we'll make you beautiful. And when you're beautiful, what are you? You're not even beautiful enough. We're told we're not beautiful enough. It's about self-worship. My image. Fame. Wouldn't it be nice to do something in this world so when we leave, everybody will remember our name? Oh yeah, that's Tony Clark. I remember what he did. Great guy. Wonderful guy. He should get a star on the walkway. Work. Men, sometimes we drive ourselves insane by work. We can worship work. Possessions. Oh, how possessions can be a false god that people worship. Have to have more, have to have more, have to have more, have to have more, have to have more. Possessions. And here's a touchy one that I came on before, sports. We can worship sports to the extent where the players replace God. Everything they say and do, we worship. How great. Sport is also something where we can get involved in and say, hey, my God is not the God of heaven. My God is sport. I will be the best player. I will be the greatest person ever playing this sport. Sport, we can worship, my friends. Sport can drag us away from God as well. I'm not saying don't play sport. Play sport. Play sport. Have possessions. But don't let these things be your God your one and only thing that you follow and that you worship. You can play sport, be healthy, be thin. <laughs> and of course there is achievements. Oh, we all like to have achievements. Remember the tall poppy syndrome? We all like to get to the top. I did this. Pastor Andy built Port Augusta Church and filled it to the brim every Sabbath. Oh, wouldn't that be a good thing to grow out and boast about? Self-worship, my friends. That is self-worship. That is a dream I have, by the way, that we fill our church to the brim. Not the thing that I built it, but... There are so many things of false worship that we need to be care of. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory. Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea and the springs. This is, of course, Revelation 14, verse 7 from the three angels' message. We are warned again towards the end. There is only one God that we should worship. There is no other God that we should even consider worshipping if we want to be involved in true worship. And again, as I said, John, having gone right through the book of Revelation, wrote it, had been shown by the angel, Jesus, he'd been shown all about worship. And what does he do right at the end? In human form, he drops down to worship the angel. Yeah. It happens easy, my friends. It happens so easy. We need to be very weary. We need to be very cautious about who we worship. And who shall we worship? God. The God of creation, the God of heaven. Yeah. The real issue, my friends, of worship and false worship has nothing to do how you worship. There are so many arguments within the church as I come across where they say true worship can only be where you sit in the pews very quietly and you look like someone just stole your best toy. You ever go into those churches? I've seen more happier faces in funerals. You go into church and... 
I'm happy, 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 happy. <laughs> well, really. All right. It's not whether you're, you've got a frown, doesn't matter whether you're wearing a suit. It's not about raising your hands or clapping your hands. It's not about having drums or whatever. That's not what a true worship is all about, my friends. True worship is about who you worship. All right? Who you worship. Are you worshipping God, the God of creation? That's true worship. Are you worshipping something else or someone else? Then that is false worship. True worship, we worship the God of creation and scriptures alone. False worship, we worship any other substitute God, including ourselves. Be careful, be careful, be careful about worshipping yourself. Yeah? Keep your eyes on God. Worship God alone. Turn to the scripture and read his words. And then, my friends, you will not be tempted to follow false worship. May God bless you through the week and may you follow and worship God regardless of the situations you find yourself in. So I'm going to, I'm going to jump in here I'm going to, because we're getting on the one o'clock. I'm going to say, you're all happy. Bit of a smile wouldn't hurt. <laughs> That's better. You're all happy. I'm just going to invite you to uh, bow your heads and we're going to have benediction and then you'll be allowed to leave without singing a song. Lord, I want to thank you that in Scripture you have shown us who to worship and who not to worship. Lord, you've shown us through Scripture as well that people will fall away from you very quickly for, for no other particular reasons but because they want to. Lord, there is always the danger of worshipping ourselves or worshipping something else or somebody else. Help us to keep our minds focused on you. Help us to remember that through the hard times that you are there and that you'll get us through and that we're not the only one who are worshipping you, but there are also many other people as well. So be with us now as we go through this week. Guide and bless us. Grant us travelling mercies as we go over to Wyla. Bring us back safe and sound for this house in your name. Amen.